a quick message before we start. I've made a little four pages zine which expands on the themes of the podcast. It's packed with info and cool links. It's free for you to download on each IO. You can get it at tinyurl.com slash zineofzines or check the link on the show notes. And if you feel like to support the podcast, consider buying it. You make me happy. Part of the zine craze has something to do with how many ideas are coming out in so short a time. The scope of tabletop RPGs is so broad because we haven't really nailed it down and confined it yet into exactly what it is. And so there's a lot of people saying, hey, maybe this is like, maybe these are like rituals that we're doing. And other people are like, maybe we can tell stories about history and like simulate real life. And other people are like, I just want to goof off with my friends. Tabletop RPGs are also a way of sharing ideas and experiences. Hello, salut, bonjour. Welcome to The Lost Bay, a show about indie RPG creators and artists and what's behind their creative processes. I'm Iko. Today, my guest is Vi Hansman. Vi runs a crazy YouTube channel called Collabs Without Permission, where they do great reviews of TTRPG zines. Lately, they shared a review of the game Mothership, filmed at the Bonville Salt Flats. It's just amazing. It's a super brilliant review of the game, plus it looks like a short sci-fi film. You should check it. It's phenomenal. Vi has been collecting zine for years. We did this interview via a conferencing app, and as we were recording, I could see behind Vi shelves literally packed with zines. How long have you been uh, hanging around in the, in the zine scene? Or I've got to think through this because I, I started out with 5th edition like so many others, and then I very quickly broke away, which I'm grateful for. <laughs> <laughs> I've been collecting zines for, it hasn't been very long, like five years maybe max. I can, I can I can see a piece of the of the of your collection in the in uh, do, you, do you have do you have a lot of them or yeah like yeah. You mean a lot a lot or I've got I can just angle it this way I've got a magazine rack I've got some up here against oh, my yeah. wall I've got this little thing here that's full of zines and if I angle the camera down this this top bit is just stuffed full of them okay <laughs> Yeah, but um, I'm trying to think. I, there must have been something because I'm. I think that some of the first zines I collected might have actually been the Thousand Thousand Island zines. They seemed like um, a good thing to take a first dive on. The Thousand Thousand Islands is a series of fantasy zines inspired by the cultures and myths of Southeast Asia. It's written by Zedek Su and illustrated by Moon Kao. Both are Malaysian. The zines are beautiful and unique. And Vi made a video on ZXU. Actually, they met him on a one-day round trip to Malaysia. So I was in um, Thailand, and uh, I said, uh, um, I want to like leave you all to do your own thing for one day, and I want to fly down to Malaysia and meet ZXU. <laughs> and he did all that in one day uh, yeah so it was it was a single day i it was one day where I, I looked up how much it would cost to buy a ticket from thailand to malaysia it was like 100 dollars, and um and so i i flew down in the morning i i took a bus into kuala lumpur and zedek also took a bus down from Port Dixon to from where he lives to Kuala Lumpur. And we we got some food and we talked. And then I went and I set up my camera near a bookstore that his friend owns. And um, I got to interview him. And he's it was it was so cool. And I was I was talking about like the kind of ways that I find out about new zines. And one of those ways undoubtedly is um Questing Beast. And um one of the one of the videos that he made was on ZXU's Thousand Thousand Islands. 
And so, you know, years ago, I watched that video and then I, I bought the zines from Zedek soon afterward and read them and, and really enjoyed them. I, I just think it's so funny that there can be someone here in the States that makes a video about some books that they bought from someone in Malaysia and then I can see those. And then years later, I decide that because I saw that video and bought those books, I'm going to fly to Malaysia and meet him. <laughs> um, it's just, a, it's so fun to see that, that chain of events. One of the things that's really been happening more recently is absolutely the, the visibility of content made by, by folks in South America, in Southeast Asia, like those two scenes, the variety of creators and the amazing things that they're producing, it, it blows most of what's been out. It blows it out of the water. Um, it's just amazing to see what those creators are doing. And um, do you collect only RPG zines or do you collect also other things, stuff, zines? Or? It is almost all RPG zines. Or, well, actually, I do have a few from Exalted Funeral because I, I have a couple places where I get zines and Exalted Funeral is definitely one of them. They release some um, some like queer theory zines that I have a couple of, and that's some really fun stuff. But yeah, other than that, it's pretty much all RPG stuff. How do you you as a collector? How do you how do you keep track of what's uh, created, produced, and available? Where do you find your zines? Uh, like you said, it, it's a really large scene. Even ha ha being as spread out all over the world as it is, you know, in such a digital time, we're able to connect with each other more than ever before, and so. People will talk about their own stuff, you know, some of it comes from Zine Quest, from Kickstarter, you know, and then what you do from there, though, um, you just look up the names of the people that are involved, or you look up the name that they've given their publishing place, and then you look that up, and then they have their own online web store in another country, and you order some zines from there, and um, you see, you like, when you're, when you're Googling it, you see some other stores that are stocking it, and then you see, like, six new projects that you've never heard of, and it's like, whoa. <laughs> that's that's my favorite way to do it is like taking a dive on the ones that you've never that, that you don't recognize i think is where some of the most fun for me comes okay so there is an ocean of zines all around the globe and the profusion of zines might be overwhelming for a newcomer i know it was for me there is so much happening so many zines being released every week i've asked why where somebody new to the scene might start looking as far as practical advice, um, I am um, good friends with the purchasing agent for Exalted Funeral, um, Fiona Geist. She has her eye on a lot of different things at once. We've, we've had conversations about the kind of things that she's trying to bring into the store. And I think that if you were to look anywhere for a variety of things, not only tabletop stuff, um, exaltedfuneral.com is a good place. I could lift, list off a couple web stores, to be honest. Um, uh, Four Rogues and Monkey's Paw Games. Each web store kind of has to cultivate their own kind of identity. And you kind of get a feel for that after, you know, following the, the stuff that they they buy and promote. And um, I think that some of the some of the most interesting stuff that I've seen in print specifically has come from um, Spearwitch.com. Um, they seem to have the pulse on like a couple weirder things that don't quite make it to Exalted Funeral. Um, I found some really interesting stuff there. And would you like, I like to, to, to name a few titles or, or not, maybe you don't want to, or yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, okay. That's great. Yeah, sure. I did. Sure. I got a few. Um, I've, I have a couple here that are like beautiful as like art objects. Like I'm sure they're, they're great, but there's, there's this one. If you hear the, uh, yeah. there's like this tissue paper cover over it because it has, um, like rainbow foil detailing on the cover. Oh, I can see that. Um, yeah. it's, a uh, Casket Land, the uh, the Kruak. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. I want to talk about these two, which are Forget Everything You Thought You Knew About Bread Robots and Beans RPG. Yes. They are so strange. They're they're both very short. It's um just like one piece of uh cover paper and one stapled page inside. Both of them are. Um, but they are um <laughs> they're data RPGs, D-A-D-A. -A. You know the art movement data? Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I, sure. I could read a passage from it, but it's like, yeah, sure. let's see. <laughs> yeah. are, are, are they like uh, supplements for a, a specific game or are they full games? Um, they are um, 
they are definitely art books. It's art it's books. it's not like like not pieces of art, but just it exists more as an art object than a game. Um, so the the center spread, for example, is just like two pictures and like a bunch of words. They look like they look like advertisements, um, and they don't actually have anything to do with the game. Like there's a an image of someone pulling what looks like a cigarette box out of a jean pocket that has the word clown on it. And the text says, hey, kid, try these sometime. The, this message brought to you by Tobacco Circus Incorporated. And here's here's the, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm not yet. But the inside of the cover says, clown war? Yes, it could happen. Are you ready? Is anyone? And there's just a picture of a clown. Like it's it's very it does not care to um to have meaning. I'm trying not to laugh too much because it's very funny actually. Here's the 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 most the most game part of it. Um, the participant with the lowest Lake Geneva number is the Rizzle. Um, <laughs> all other players, oh, all others play baby Balrogs and must select either Rot Grub, Donkey, or Cleric as their class. <laughs> Balrogs begin with ten. All dice are D12. And so like, like it doesn't, it, it's, it's, it's antithetical to like any kind of tabletop design because it says Balrogs begin with a score of 10, but it doesn't say what that means or, or what the donkey starts with. And you start asking yourself that question and you realize how dumb you sound in your own head where it's like, why am I asking what the donkey starts with? Okay. I'm going to check. I'm going to check those. Uh, if I, if, if there's, they're still available somewhere, uh, uh... I, I think they are. Um, they were they were printed in really low quantities. I, I think they're they're kind of an art exercise where it's like let's make a a, a zine together to remember that this is a, a fun thing to do that we that we all do together. Uh, and then the last one that I have here is kind of um, it feels the most ziny to me. There's no cover paper. It's all it's all just kind of a, a thin paper. It's black and white. It's called Brain Modification or an Archival History of Ego Death. It's a kind of metatextual zine about the creation of the game, um, a guide to casting phantoms in the revolution. It's artsy in that there's some kind of like a, a public domain collage. There's a picture of the two um, authors on the back together that's been uh, like laid over with like a quote. There's a picture of the game. We're, we're here to have a, a conversation with the designer about the feelings that making this game brought about, what it was like to run a Kickstarter, to go through the ups and downs of it, um, barely coming to funding and realizing they don't really have enough money to produce this boxed game, but doing it anyway. And they started a little podcast to go along with it called the Brain Trust Podcast. And and like, I love all of these. Like, I love the zines that are art objects, that are weird art stuff in terms of the writing that are not meant to be played or as much as they are to be just kind of read and enjoyed. And I love this stuff that is trying to do something different about talking about the process of making zines, like for, for the, for the joy of, of sharing information freely so that more people can get in on this fun. You know, you see, like I was talking about earlier, there are some that go for kind of like art objects. But I think that on the other end of that spectrum, it's really nice to see things that are like, hey, um, we're using this opportunity to embrace the ephemeral nature of zines. And, and we want you to to use it and write in it and take the cover off and, and fold it. There's there's one zine that I have that's called. Um, oh, I forget. I forget what it's called, but it's basically like a, a fill in the blanks, do your own dungeon thing where they have um, they have like pictural prompts. Here are four little images and and like a and they're pointing to a room and um, and you should write in the zine because and they're, and they're like, you can photocopy this. It's free um, on the Internet if you want to print out your own. Um, and that's just so cool where it's like, yeah, write, write in it because because it's cheap and it's yours, and why not? The zine Vi is talking about is called R&D, which probably stands for Random Number Dungeon. The amazing thing about the zine scene is not only the variety of voices that it harbors, but also the variety of the creative processes. 
In a time where everything is largely digital, some creators or collectors continue to print and produce zines with simple techniques somehow faithful to the spirit of the first sci-fi or punk zines. Oh, it was it was Nate Treme did a I don't I don't know if he drew it, but he he shared a, a comic, a guide to printing a zine, and it was like go go into your office at work and then print out eighty copies. <laughs> <laughs> and then send them to people online. It was very much like use whatever resources you have. Print it however you can and it doesn't have to look great. You know, I'm going to have some nice flipping noises. But yeah, Dungeons on a Dime are these big um beautiful zines. They're risograph printed on yeah, riser printed using soya-based inks, banana fiber screens uh, on recycled and sustainable paper. But the reason that um the person in charge of that, Brian, started printing those was because he worked in a print shop and they kind of had this other side to it where it was like, it's kind of this artsy thing. Like we have all of our inks and papers. It's really cool seeing people take this opportunity to go back to alternate methods of printing because you see, you know, whenever you get a lot of people trying one thing, and in this case, it's print on demand and mix them doing their mass produced zines. You get a lot of stuff that can look the same. So there's going to be people that look for other ways to do it and get a, a unique look. So there's, there's some variety in how many things are getting done. There is, like almost on a daily basis, a constant cross-pollination of ideas and techniques among participants to the RPG scene. It's phenomenal. I really wonder why. What does that mean? Of course, it means that we love TTRPGs. But what does that mean, actually? Here's why about it. I think its prevalence has something to do with how new the scene is, because tabletop RPGs are kind of a like a really recent phenomenon historically. And I think that part of the zine craze has something to do with how many ideas are coming out in so short a time, because the scope of tabletop RPGs is so broad because we haven't really nailed it down and confined it yet into exactly what it is. And so there's a lot of people saying, hey, maybe this is like Maybe these are like rituals that we're doing. And other people are like, maybe we can tell stories about history and like simulate real life. And other people are like, I just want to goof off with my friends. Since all of those are, answers are, are yes. And because tabletop RPGs are such, a, such an oral tradition, everything that we do is, is written down. So you, you mentioned um, zines in other disciplines. Those disciplines are written ones. They're ones where theory and sharing ideas and sharing, um, you know, stories are the primary method of interaction with it. I think that we've kind of adopted that in the way that tabletop RPGs are also a way of sharing ideas and experiences. ZineQuest is an event, a game jam, if you will, promoted by the crowdfunding platform Kickstarter. Mixum, a printer service present both in the USA and in the UK, is an official partner of ZineQuest. It offers a line of affordable printing solutions tailored for Zine production. ZineQuest and Mixum have probably both contributed to the visibility of indie RPG creators, but not without controversy. I think I think one of the biggest things that ZineQuest did was bring a lot of attention to um, to one way to do it. Right. I forget if the first Zine Quest explicitly mentioned Mixum, um, but I think either they did or it was really seen as the um, the number one option that would be available to almost every creator. And so people that didn't think they could do it or didn't know wh where they could get started suddenly had a really easy like, you know, it's not drag and drop the PDF, but it's easy enough that it shows you how it can be done. I mean, it's it's only been going on for three years now. Every time it's gotten bigger, most of the projects fund. It was seen as a, a way to get your project out there that that was like proven and and accessible. So yeah, I think the biggest thing ZineQuest did was show a huge number of people that they can they can make it if they want to. Um, the other side of that was that with their platform, they chose to kind of have control over um, what is and is not a zine, which has been a big big controversial point. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's all this stuff about how long it can be and how it has to be bound and how many colors it can have. There's value in that on the one hand, because it, you know, artistic constraints are good. But on the other hand, a lot of people felt it was prescriptive for something that was meant to be like freeform and accessible. And th there are a lot of people that didn't like seeing a big 
you know, company like Kickstarter trying to control what was really supposed to be kind of an, an independent kind of punky thing, you know. In those five years, you know, have you seen like any trends in how zines tra- are I mean, are they transforming themselves? Um, With the rise of Zine Quest, there was a lot of single issue zines and where it's like, you know, here is a zine, but it's the entire game. Or, or here's a zine and it's, it's just this one adventure and it kind of stands on its own. That's been happening more often. Like Melsonian Arts Council publishes a periodical called The Undercroft. It might be a, a gamble to, to want to see how many repeat customers you can get. But uh, something that I, I'd like to see a return to is a, a set of zines that are like three issues or five issues. Um, but, but yeah, I'd say if there's anything that's, that's, that's kind of changed, it's uh, games that are contained in a single zine. Vi is not only a podcaster or a collector, they also do editing on some very cool RPGs like the upcoming Best Left Buried Deeper or Ice Fleet RPG or the apocalyptic fantasy RPG Morkborg. The highest profile projects that I've been a part of is um, is Mirkbori, you know, from from the uh, Free League Kima Der Catastrophe folks. Um, it's the first time I hear somebody pronouncing it. Uh, like I guess it's supposed no, to be I, pronounced. I, I, I often say it Morkborg. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's how most oh, okay. well, at least uh, American spe- uh, like English speakers would pronounce Morkborg. Oh yeah, e- even. E- even French people. Yep. So, yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I think I was. Um, I I I know how to pronounce it because um, I was on a few. I was on a few pro- podcasts and and uh, I was on one with Johan and he he pronounced it and I was like, wait, wait, can you do that? How do you how do you <laughs> He's like Mirgbori? And I'm like, all right, all right. That was I think the the part of the reason that I got that job is because uh, uh, I think Johan is kind of a he's he's quite punkish he's he's yeah. a punk <laughs> he has that attitude it's funny i I messaged him and i was like i, I heard you're doing Mirk body and uh, i saw the kickstarter and uh if you need an editor then let me know and he said what are your rates and i said these are my rates and he said okay and i was like oh okay okay huh <laughs> the kickstarter that sold the core book did not do nearly as well as this like uh, community content zine that they put out after it like that zine like was so much more successful because people loved that core book they just, it, it was kind of a uh, it was not a Kickstarter success but it was an overall a huge success um, and so I think it surprised Johan and, and everyone else so it was very much he was treating it as a personal project but um, yeah as, as just a, a one example of something I've, I've worked on so it's really so cool to see how people across the globe work together on amazing projects. I keep asking myself, is the zine craze going to last or is it going to evolve into something else? Here's why. In some ways, there, the, there's something about zines is that they are kind of uh, allowed to be ephemeral. They're allowed to come and go and it's, and it's okay that they do. And I think that Part of what we're going to see is that zines are a way to test the waters for yourself. And so as much as I do think that, that zines are, the zine scene is going to change, I think that what we're also going to see is a lot of the names of people who um, are creating in zine quests, you know, in, in producing their own independent zines, um, are going to go on to be kind of the people that are making the cool new things of the next couple of years, you know. Um, and I think also that, you know, in some ways, getting your zine into a physical format is not actually accessible to everyone, you know, depending on finances, uh, geographical location, all the all these factors. I love my zine collection, the physical books, but I think that there are alternate ways to uh, to kind of have that that spirit of being accessible to everyone about how you can just write something down. That's kind of what blogging looked like. But I think that also that is what um, itch.io is to some degree, where it's it's a, a very accessible platform for a variety of, of projects, whether it's something that's in a, in a notes app or whether it's something that has, you know, multiple illustrators and an editor and a few writers, you know, in this big production. 
in some ways, um, you know, reckoning with digital products as well as physical ones is, is part of the next step because it's, it's a little bit more accessible. And we talk about all, how already the, the number of voices, the variety of voices we're able to, uh, to, to see. Um, I think that, you know, bringing down the barrier of, of requiring it to be printed is, is even better, you know, it's even more accessible. That was Vi Hansman from the YouTube channel Collabs Without Permission. Check their YouTube channel, it's amazing. I support Vi on Patreon and patrons have access to a secret YouTube playlist and more. I'll put the links in the show notes. The Lost Bay is a podcast about indie RPG creators and artists and what's behind their creative processes. It's produced by me, Ico, and music is by Every Isles. If you want to know more about our guest's collection of zines, risograph, or the story of zines, check the Zine of Zines. It's filled with infos and thoughts and cool links. You can download it on itch.io for free or at tinyurl.com slash zineofzines.